So to an observer at rest, a moving light clock seems to be running too slowly by the factor gamma. A ruler or anything else in motion also seems contracted by that same factor. In the strange arithmetic of relativity, no matter how you look at it, when one speed is added to another, the result is always less than the speed of light. Henry, the twin who zoomed away and then came back, has only aged a couple of months. But Albert, the twin who never switched inertial frames, has aged 20 years. Time dilation, length contraction, simultaneity. None of these phenomena manifest in our everyday experience, and many of them are completely contradictory with our fundamental intuitions. So how is it that physicists can get away with such raving nonsense and not have to deal with any hordes of skeptics calling baloney? Consider the following experiment. Go and get yourself two cesium atomic clocks and synchronize them. Now place the clocks together on a table and wait 24 hours. When finished, compare them. How much did they drift over the course of a day? The answer is actually quite remarkable. These devices are so precise at keeping time that the average drift between them can be engineered to less than one nanosecond per day. Now let's shake things up a bit. Go and get yourself two more cesium atomic clocks and place them in commercial aircraft. Take each clock up to 50,000 feet and fly around the world. Send one clock east and the other clock west. When finished, compare the synchronization between the travelers and the stationary clocks. Surely, the mere act of picking up a clock and moving around with it will have no effect on its synchronization, would it? Wrong. As odd as it may sound, the eastward traveling clock will actually lose about 60 nanoseconds of time, while the westward traveling clock will gain nearly 270 nanoseconds. Even more interesting, this is exactly the same amount of time deviation predicted mathematically by Einstein's equations from general relativity. Gravity and motion really do alter the flow of time, and we can measure this effect directly. So no matter how bizarre or counterintuitive it may feel, we have no choice but to accept that this is a real aspect of nature. The physicists are seriously not making this stuff up. So what does this have to do with matters of faith? Think about the many extraordinary claims of religious organizations. For example, one especially popular idea has to do with the power of prayer. Among countless religious institutions, it is a commonly held belief that prayer has the power to generate such spectacular results as moving mountains and curing diseases. But how do religious believers attempt to convince us about these claims? Can they likewise demonstrate the validity of such fantastic phenomena? Consider the following experiment. Go and find yourself a group of hospital patients undergoing cardiac bypass surgery. Although such a procedure is fairly routine by modern standards, post-operative complications are still a very common experience. It should therefore come as no surprise when as many as 50% of the patients report some form of complication within 30 days of their surgery. Now, let's shake things up a bit. Go and find yourself a second group of patients undergoing the same surgery. This time, gather together with your favorite Christian denominations and pray regularly for the health and speedy recovery of your group. Once 30 days have passed, compare the levels of post-operative complications between each group. Surely, the benevolent deity of Christianity would be more than happy to manifest his divine power through the rapid recovery of his suffering children, right? Well, wrong. Of all the studies performed on the effect of intercessory prayer, none have yet to provide any significant reproducible results. Prayer simply does not work as advertised. So what can we learn from these simple demonstrations? Are there any supernatural beliefs with a demonstrable, replicable effect on our tangible reality? What is really going on inside the world of religion and faith? Throughout this video series, we have examined claims made by professional apologetics, popular evangelists, spiritual authorities, and ordinary laymen. We have seen complex philosophical arguments, emotionally impassioned pleas, and sincere personal testimonies. Yet in all of our searching, the one thing we have yet to see is basic empirical evidence. Even on the rare occasions when a religious tenet does offer itself to the chopping block of experimental testing, observations have always wound up falsifying the claim. All spiritual beliefs are, at best, empirically unfounded, or at worst, demonstrably false. 
Unless this situation ever changes, we are intellectually bound to operate under the tentative conclusion that religious beliefs are completely at odds with reality. There is no God, there is no afterlife, and there are no miracles. This much at least should be obvious. Without quantifiable observations and experiments on which to base our understanding, there is no functional difference between ideas that genuinely reflect reality and ideas that were made up out of whole cloth. Anyone who exercises a shred of rational inquiry will very quickly come to this same conclusion. But if that is all it takes, then why are there still so many believers? Why is the world teeming with literally billions of Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and so many others? This is an observation that cries out for an explanation. Take a long look at this flowchart. It may not be the most rigorous scientific presentation, but it still makes a very serious point. Every one of these arrows represents a psychological mechanism by which an idea can be conjured out of pure imagination and then implanted into the human brain with statistical reliability. Every one of these arrows has been empirically demonstrated and replicated under controlled laboratory conditions. And, as we have illustrated throughout this video series, every last one has been openly exploited by religious believers in an attempt to convince us of the reality of some spiritual idea. Yet sadly, this is not even the half of it. We could easily do this for hours. This chart is only the tip of a gargantuan psychological iceberg. We have not even touched on the topics of hindsight bias, basking in reflected glory, Dunning-Kruger effects, Barnum effects, groupthink, stereotyping, false consensus effects, mere exposure effects, placebo effects. The list goes on and on. There is a valuable lesson to be learned from this jumbled mess of psychological spaghetti. Peer pressure and social indoctrination have far more influence on our choices than even the most logically reasoned arguments. With the right psychological stimulus, even our very memories and sensory perceptions can be readily distorted. We human beings are not nearly as intuitive or rational as we arrogantly like to think we are. This simple fact says far more about religion than any philosophical debate ever could. Not only is religious belief empirically unjustified, but we also have a set of perfectly natural mechanisms by which spiritual convictions can be engineered in the first place. And, most damning of all, we have a documented account of religious apologetics from all walks of life as they readily utilize those very same mechanisms in their efforts to spread their beliefs. Allegedly pious men of God, seeking only to spread what they consider to be the truth, are resorting to tools which we know have the power to generate belief in anything. This, above all else, is the ultimate crime against humanity committed by religion. The very tools of science by which we build practical confidence in the true state of reality and religions make every effort to avoid them. Some even go so far as to demonize them. The very cognitive failures that skew our judgment and distort our very perception and religions make every effort to exploit them, embrace them even. Truth simply means less in religion than does belief or conformity. Yet, despite all of this, it is important to realize that religion is not the problem. Religion is merely a symptom. The true underlying problem is ourselves. It is the natural human tendency to generate intense convictions in the total absence of rigorous empirical evidence. It is the default ignorance of our own fallibility and subsequent failure to exercise proper scientific methods when we pursue knowledge. It is our stark resistance against changing our minds and admitting error even when faced with an avalanche of evidence to the contrary. This, I imagine, above all else, is the origin of all our troubles. It is the reason why we have bizarre conspiracy theories, vaccination denial, psychic media, ufology, creationism, astrology, homeopathy, and every other stubborn superstition that continues to stall human progress. So how do we overcome our natural human propensities for psychological bias? There may not be an easy answer for this. We are faced with an overwhelming social and biological infrastructure of ignorance, credulity, and perceptual distortion. For the time being, it seems, the only apparent solution to this problem is to continually redouble our efforts at scientific education and rational skepticism, especially when it comes to young children. Only by learning to embrace our own intuitive and perceptual weaknesses can we take steps to actively counteract them. This is the very essence of the scientific method. 
It is the best and only tool we have for illuminating the darkness of superstition with the light of knowledge. And our small planet, at this moment, here we face a critical branch point in history. What we do with our world right now will propagate down through the centuries and powerfully affect the destiny of our descendants. It is well within our power to destroy our civilization and perhaps our species as well. If we capitulate to superstition or greed or stupidity, we can plunge our world into a darkness deeper than the time between the collapse of classical civilization and the Italian Renaissance. But we are also capable of using our compassion and our intelligence, our technology and our wealth to make an abundant and meaningful life for every inhabitant of this planet, to enhance enormously our understanding of the universe and to carry us to the stars.